Uh, this is uh, lecture number 30A on the uh, uh, Empire Strikes Back, uh, part one, uh, against Guatemala. And uh, last, this is based on chapter, what's going to be chapter 47 in next year's 2016 edition of the ABCs of Communism, Bolshevism 2016, which is, that chapter is entitled, The Rebel Base Defends the People of Guatemala. Now, in these lectures, we visited Guatemala in general when we discussed primitive communism and the chiefdom transition in the initial lectures and chapters of this book. We discussed it again tangentially in our discussion of the early period of Mexican prehistory in Chapter 30 as part of Mesoamerica and in the lectures that correspond with that. This time, we begin with some specific background in Guatemalan prehistory. <clears throat> that is, background to the last half century of Guatemala's fight for independence from U.S. imperialism and the assistance provided by the communist rebel base in Cuba. As with every Latin American country, the prehistory begins with this period of time when Native Americans lived under primitive communism, which is to say hunting and gathering bands and tribal agriculture. Guatemala also experienced the chiefdom transition to the slave stage um, slavery as a socio-cultural evolutionary stage gave way to feudalism as a stage when feudalism arrived in Guatemala um, and on the swords of the Spanish Ronin. Now, Guatemalan feudalism evolved in place into the capitalist stage. The fight for modern communism in Guatemala is ongoing, as you will see in this lecture and the following one. Let's take a look at the geographical and ecological setting to begin with. Guatemala is e ecologically the vast northern lowlands of Peten, P-E-T-E-N, department. Peten is a department or province of the nation of Guatemala. It is geographically the northernmost department of Guatemala and is certainly the largest department at 12,960 square miles. Petén accounts for about one-third of Guatemala's area, and the capital is Flores. The population in 2005 was estimated at 450,000. Now, Petén is a region I got to know well personally when working for NL Industries Wireline Division, logging a test well for Pemex near the Guatemalan border. At the time, the Guatemalan puppet army of the U.S. CIA was busy slaughtering native people in the Petén in service of Tequita, that is what used to be called United Fruit Company, and they often chased these villagers into bordering Chiapas. And this Pemex well that I was logging was um, very close to the Chiapas border, and as a consequence, Mexico's president had sent the Mexican army to seal the border and protect our wireline service and, of course, the Pemex drilling operations. <clears throat> now, this uh, was a particularly important test well, and we were heading for 30,000 feet, and it had been it had been in process, therefore, for a couple of years, the drilling operation, and uh, what it uncovered eventually was a vast new reservoir of uh, oil and gas. The uh, this was such a top secret project at the time that the Mexican secret police had plainclothes guys with submachine guns all around the platform while I was doing this logging. And as soon as it got done, uh, I wrapped that log up and uh, it was taken on a helicopter to uh, Pemex headquarters in Mexico City. Well, at any rate, um, otherwise, Guatemala is, uh, when you get outside of Petén, is a uh, mountainous with a small desert and some dune patches here and there, hilly valleys except for the south coastal area. Two mountain chains traverse Guatemala from west to east, dividing Guatemala into its three environmental regions. And those regions then are the Petén region, which is north of the mountains and is by far the largest part of Guatemala as a nation. Secondly, the highlands, where the mountains are located. And thirdly, the Pacific coast south of the mountains. Now, the climatic regimes and the social geography 
are uh, of particular importance here because all the major cities are located in the highlands and the Pacific coast regions. By comparison, Patan is sparsely populated and the people that live there are largely living much in a Neolithic kind of way of life in relatively small villages. These three regions vary in climate, elevation, and landscape and provide dramatic contrast between hot and humid tropical lowlands in the uh, Patan region, which is just an extension of, the, of Mexico's Yucatan uh, environment, and uh, the colder and drier highland peaks. Volcan Tahumulco at 4,220 meters uh, is the highest point in Central American countries. And you multiply that times 3.1 or 3.15 and you get the, the height in actual feet. So this is around 1,300 feet high. The fluvial geography, that is the geography of the rivers, the rivers are short and shallow in the Pacific drainage basins. Rivers become larger and deeper in the Caribbean and the Gulf of Mexico drainage basins. These basins include the Polo Chic and Dulce rivers, which drain into Lake Isabel and the Motagua River. Uh, mountain streams also accumulate in the Sarstoon River that forms the boundary with Belize and the Usumacinta uh, River. Belize is also, most of you would call it Belize. The Usumacinta forms the boundary between Petén and the Mexican state of Chiapas. Primitive Communism. Now, archaeological evidence demonstrates human presence as early as 20,000 years ago in the form of obsidian arrow points. Um, however, we know that Mexico was occupied by at least 40,000 years ago, if not earlier. Therefore, Guatemala probably was as well. And as we have mentioned innumerable, innumerable times in these lectures, all of the Americas uh, were initially occupied in a sociocultural stage of primitive communism, whether it be hunting and gathering bands, tribal agriculturalists, uh, at any rate, towards civilization, that is, towards slavery. You know, civilization is the word that we use often to mean the beginning of the stage slave, uh, slave stage. However, that may be, primitive communism of the hunting and gathering band level variety gave way to tribal agriculture uh, in Guatemala, and archaeological proof of this comes in the form of pollen samples from the Patén and the Pacific Ocean coast. These show that maize cultivation was developed about 5,500 years ago, and chiefdom sites back, uh, date back to as early as 8,500 years ago, and they've been found in Quiche in the highlands and Sipacate, and in Esquintla on the central Pacific coast. As an archaeologist, I divide the pre-Columbian history of Mesoamerica into eight stages. Uh, the Lithic stage, first of all. Secondly, the Proto-Archaic stage. Thirdly, the Archaic stage. Fourth, the formative tribal agricultural stage. And fifth, the formative simple chiefdom stage. In the text, when you get it, it's not so important right now, uh, you'll see the actual hard dates that I attach to those, such as, sixthly, we have the pre-classic period of advanced theocratic chiefdoms that dates from roughly 3,000 years ago, or 3,000 B.C. to about 250 B.C. And then that's followed up by the classic period of the early slave stage, which is around 250 to 900 A.D. on the Christian calendar, and the eight post-classic period from 900 to 1500 A.D. period of the later slave stage, which is cut short by the arrival of the Spanish Ronin and the feudal stage. The origin of the Mayan peoples, therefore, lies in the formative tribal agricultural period, which features small villages of farmers who lived in huts. The later formative of simple chieftains stage features the addition of a few permanent buildings. Monumental architecture of the advanced theocratic stage occurs at such sites as La Blanca, uh, San Marcos, and by 3,000 years ago, that is by 1,000 BC, more of these ATC stage sites, including the ceremonial sites at Miraflores and El Naranjo from 801 BC, um, 
exist and uh, the, the earliest monumental masks in the Mirador Basin cities of Nakbe, Sulnal, El Tintel, Watna, and El Mirador have been found and some, some of these have been excavated. These latter sites include not only the ATC stage but also proof of their evolution into the early slave stage in Guatemala. Both the El Tigre and Monos pyramids encompass volumes greater than 250,000 cubic meters, and the city lay at the center of a populous and well-integrated region. So these are places which went from being advanced theocratic chiefdoms into early kingdoms. The Mayan civilization in the classic period of Mesoamerican civilization corresponds to the height of the Maya civilization, which as you know now is another way of saying that it corresponds to the full-scale introduction of slavery as a socio-cultural stage. Countless sites throughout uh, Guatemala represent the classic period, although the largest concentration of them is in the department of Petén. It was a period characterized by large city building, the development of independent, class-divided, state-organized city-states, and the region had contact with other Mesoamerican cultures. This lasted until around 900 AD, when the classic Maya civilization collapsed. And it collapsed, collapsed because civil uh, class war led the Maya to abandon many of these cities of the central lowlands. Now, it may well be that drought-induced famine was the externally, that is, secondarily, causal trigger. However, as you have learned by now, external causation can never be primary. The primary cause, that is, the prime mover, must always be internal to any ph uh, phenomenon. This is one of our dialectical materialist laws, including any society. Therefore, we can be surgically precise in ascribing the causal primary locale to the division of society into classes, since by definition and by archaeological proof, the state, which is to say the army and police, exist in the hands of a ruling class, then warfare between said classes would be necessary for the oppressed to persevere over their masters. Now, a few more comments on this environmental conditioning cause. If for no other reason than in most of the literature, you're going to see a lot of talk about how uh, the rapid change in the environment caused the collapse. But you know now, because you understand dialectical materialism from our earlier discussions of it, that uh, that cannot be the case. The primary cause has to be something internal. The environment, of course, is a conditioning cause. And physical scientists studying lake beds and ancient pollen have discovered drought at the time of the classic period slave stage civil war in the Mayan region. In fact, there seemed to have been a long series of prolonged droughts that continually exacerbated the unequal status of large numbers of farming persons. The post-classic period is represented in the emergence of regional kingdoms. Among them are the kingdoms represented in sites such as the Itza, Kowo, Yalein, Kechai, and the Paten, and the Mam, Kiche, uh, Kachikel, Chahoma, Sutumul, Pocomichi, Kechi, and Chorti in the highlands. These cities are either kingdoms in themselves or part of larger polities. They preserved many aspects of Mayan culture, but it would never equal the size or power of the classic cities. The Maya civilization shares many features with other Mesoamerican civilizations due to the high degree of interaction and cultural diffusion that characterized Mesoamerica. In other words, advances such as writing, epigraphy, and the calendar did not originate with the Maya. However, their civilization fully developed them. Maya influence extended into contemporary Honduras and El Salvador, and Belize, as well as central Mexico. All told, the Mayan civilization, in one form or another, flourished over a distance of a thousand miles from one end of the Maya region to the other. In turn, outside influences affected Mayan art and architecture. Then the feudal Ronin arrived. Now, Ronin is a term 
used in feudal Japan for unemployed knights. Such persons often became bandits of the highwaymen variety or pirates raiding the shores of Japan, Korea, and China. In Spain, such persons who would like to have been employed as knights, for Isabel, for example, in her Hermanidad, bunch of thugs, or some other lord, but for reasons of fortune often had found themselves on the outs, constitute this kind of uh, uh, ronin in the, uh, the Spanish variety. Well, these types had fled to what they called the New World in the Americas, and they were enslaving Indians on the first islands they occupied. And these, these were Hispaniola, which is now Haiti and the Dominican Republic, and Cuba. Then news came to Cuba of a city of gold in what we call Mexico. Hernan Cortez, as we've discussed before, assembled an investor group of these Ronin in Cuba to, to go and conquer this new, uh, what was new to them, land, which many of them thought was probably Japan or the East Indies. Upon arriving in what they called the New World, the Spanish Ronin conquered what is now Mexico beginning in 1519 and started several expeditions to what is now Guatemala immediately thereafter. So before long, contact resulted in an epidemic throughout Mesoamerica that devastated native populations, and this included much of Guatemala as well. It's interesting to note that, first of all, Spanish feudalism incorporated the enslavement of Indians. On the other hand, secondly, uh, the New World incorporated feudalism into what had been the then extant slave stage of life in New Spain, which included Guatemala. Therefore, the surviving populations of native peoples moved from native slave stage to the imported Spanish feudal stage as slaves rather than as serfs. And this, of course, is going to have some far-reaching ramifications over the next 500 years, right up into the present day in 2015. During the colonial period, Hernan Cortes, who had led the Spanish Ronin conquest of Mexico, granted a permit to Captains Gonzalo de Alvarado and his brother Pedro de Alvarado to conquer what we now call Guatemala. Alvarado at first allied himself with the Cachiquel nation to fight against their traditional rivals, the Quiche nation. The Alvarados later turned against the Cachiquel and eventually held the entire region under their domination. Several families of Spanish descent uh, subsequently rose to prominence in colonial Guatemala, including among these families besides the Alvarados are the surnames that will be important in the colonial period, names such as de Arrivi Arivillaga, uh, uh, Arobave, Alvarez de las Asturias, uh, of Silena, Gonzalez de Paitres, Coronado, uh, Galvez, Corral, Mencos, Delgado de Nájer, and de la Tovilla, and finally Verón de Barresa. During the colonial period, Guatemala was an audiencia, and then a captain general, captaincy general of Spain and then part of, the, of New Spain, that is Mexico. The first capital, Villa de Santiago de Guatemala, now known as Tecpan, was founded on the 25th of July of 1524, and it was located near Iximche, that had been the Cachiquel capital city. Then the capital moved to Ciudad Vieja on the 22nd of November in 1527, after the Cachiquel attack on Villa de Santiago de Guatemala. On the 11th of September in 1541, the new capital was flooded when the lagoon in the crater of the Agua Volcano collapsed due to heavy rains and earthquakes and washed it away. So the capital city was moved again four miles to Antigua, Guatemala, in the Panchoy Valley. Antigua is now a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Several earthquakes destroyed this city, in turn, in 1773 and 1774. So the King of Spain authorized the move of the capital again to its current location in the Ermita Valley, that valley named after a Catholic church dedicated to the Virgin de El Carmen. This new capital was founded on the 2nd of January of 1776.
In the interregnum, as in the rest of Spanish America, the centuries following the Ronin conquest consisted of enslaved or sometimes enserved Indians working the latifundias of the new ruling families. What ended this period was the defeat of the Napoleonic regime in Madrid in the Peninsular War in Iberia. With the total collapse of Napoleonic Europe, the post-Congress of Vienna, that is post-1815 period, featured the spread of revolutionary ideas into the Americas and the struggle of the Creole bourgeoisie for power in the Americas. Now, Creoles are just Spaniards born in the New World with little or no contact with Iberia afterwards. And for the most part, they really don't want any contact. This new class of Spanish rulers would constantly agitate for home rule. Independence for the Spanish-American nations. On the September 15th of 1821, the Captaincy General of Guatemala, formed by the Mexican states of Chiapas, and Guatemala and El Salvador, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, and Honduras officially proclaimed its independence from Spain. This was the long sought after home rule desired by the ruling Creole feudal class and the new class of bourgeoisie. Then the Captaincy General was dissolved two years later. This region had been formally subject to New Spain throughout the colonial period, but as a practical matter had been administered separately. It was not until 1825 that Guatemala created its own flag. The leader of this movement was named Carrera. In 1838, the liberal forces of the Honduran leader Francisco Morazon and Guatemalan Jose Francisco Barundia invaded Guatemala and reached San Sur, where they ex executed Chua Alvarez, Carrera's father-in-law. They impaled his head on a pike as a warning to all followers of the Guatemalan caudillo. On learning this, Carrera and his wife Petrona, who had come to confront Morazan as soon as they learned of the invasion, said that they would never forget Matas, Mata Quesitla at the time, where they publicly swore they would never forgive Morazan, even in his grave. So the Carrera family felt it impossible to respect anyone who would not avenge their family members, and this set up a, a classical feud. After sending several envoys which Carrera would not receive, especially Barundia, whom Carrera did, wa did not want to murder in cold blood, Morazan began a scorched-earth offensive, destroying villages in his path and stripping of them, them of their few assets. The Carrera forces had to hide in the mountains. Believing that Carrera was totally defeated, Morazan and Barundia marched on to Guatemala City. There they were welcomed as, welcomed as saviors by the state governor Pedro Valenzuela and members of the conservative Aysenena clan. They sponsored the liberal battalions, and Valenzuela and Barundia gave Morazan all the Guatemalan resources he needed to solve his financial problems. The Creoles of both parties celebrated that they finally had a Creole, uh, a Creole Cadillo, Morazan, and Morazan promised that he would crush the peasant rebellion. Morazan used the cash to support Los Altos. He then replaced Valenzuela by Mariano Rivera Paz, a member of the Aysenena clan. However, Morazan did not return to the Aysenena clan their property that had been confiscated in 1829. So this set up uh, more antagonism in the feudal feud. Uh, well, we can skip over a little bit of this. The, the long and short of it is that the insurgency forced Morazan to return to El Salvador to fight to save his federal mandate, and along the way Morazan increased repression in eastern Guatemala as punishment for helping Carrera. Knowing that Morazon had gone to El Salvador, Carrera tried to take Salama with the small force that remained. There he was defeated, losing in the process his brother Loriano in the fighting. With just a few men left, he managed to escape badly, badly wounded to Sarate. After recovering, he counterattacked a detachment in Juliapa and managed to get a small amount of booty. True to tradition, he shared this booty with the volunteers who accompanied him, 
and then they prepared to attack Petapa near Guatemala City, where he was victorious, though with heavy casualties. In September of that year, he attempted an assault on the capital of Guatemala, but the liberal general, Carlos Salazar Castro, defeated him in the fields of Villa Nueva, and Carrera had to retreat. After an unsuccessful attempt to uh, uh, take the Quetzaltenanga area, Carrera was surrounded and wounded, and he had to capitulate to the Mexican general, Agustin Guzman, who had been in Quetzaltenango since the time of Vicente uh, Filisola's arrival in 1823. Morazan had the opportunity to shoot Carrera, but not, did not because he needed the support of the Guatemalan peasants to counterattack the Francisco Ferreira in El Salvador. Morazan left Carrera in charge of a small fort in Mita and without any weapons. Knowing that Morazan was going to attack El Salvador, Francisco Ferreira gave arms and ammunition to Carrera and convinced him to attack Guatemala City. Meanwhile, despite insistent advice to definitely crush Carrera and his forces, Salazar tried to negotiate with him diplomatically. He even went as far as to show that he neither feared nor distrusted Carrera by removing the fortifications of the Guatemalan capital in place uh, uh, since it had been in place since the Battle of Villanueva. Taking advantage of Salazar's good faith and Ferreira's weapons, Carrera took Guatemala City by surprise on April 13, 89. Castro, Salazar, Mariano Galvez, and Barundia fled before the arrival of Carrera's militiamen. Salazar, his nightshirt, vaulted roofs of neighboring houses and sought refuge reaching the border disguised as a peasant. With Salazar gone, Carrera reinstated Rivera Paz as head of state of Guatemala. Then, between 1838 and 1840, Guatemala faced a secessionist movement in the city of Quetzaltenango, uh, who founded the breakaway state of Los Altos, which sought independence from Guatemala. The most important members of the Liberal Party of Guatemala and the liberal enemies of the conservative regime moved to Los Altos, leaving their exile in El Salvador. The liberals in Los Altos began severely criticizing the conservative government of Rivera Paz. Los Altos was the region with the main production and economic activity of the former state of Guatemala. Without Los Altos, conservatives lost much of the resources that had given Guatemala, Guatemala hegemony in Central America. The government of Guatemala tried to reach a peaceful solution, but two years of bloody conflict followed instead, and in 1840, Belgium began to act as an external support, a source of support for Carrera's independence movement in an effort to exert influence in Central America. Uh, the Belgian Colonization Company, commissioned by Belgian King Leopold I, became the administrator of Santo Tomas de Castilla, replacing the failed British eastern coast of Central America, commercial and agricultural company. Even though the colony eventually crumbled, Belgium continued to support Carrera in the mid-1800s, although Britain continued to be its main business and political partner to Carrera's regime. Rafael Carrera was elected Guatemalan governor in 1844. Settlers from Germany then arrived in the mid-1800s, and German settlers acquired land and grew coffee plantations in Alta Verapaz and Quetzaltenango. Well, between 1847 and 1851, Guatemala declared itself an independent republic, and Carrera became its first president. During the first time as president, Carrera had brought the country back from extreme conservatism to a traditional moderation. In 1848, the liberals were able to drive him from office after the country had been in turmoil for several months. Carrera resigned of his own free will and left for Mexico. The new liberal regime allied itself with the Isenena family and swiftly passed a law ordering Carrera's execution if he should ever dare return to Guatemalan soil. The liberal, liberal Creoles from Quetzaltenango were led by General Agustin Guzman, who 
occupied the city after Corregidor General Mariano Paredes was called to Guatemala City to take over the presidential office. And they declared on August 26, 1848, that Los Altos was an independent state once again. So the new state had the support of Vasconcelos, the Vasconcelos regime in El Salvador, which we'll be talking about eventually, and the rebel guerrilla army of Vicente and Serapio Cruz, who were sworn en enemies of Carrera. The interim government was led by Guzman himself and had Florencio Molina and the priest Fernando Davila as his cabinet members. On the 5th of September of 1848, the Creole alternatives chose a formal government led by the Fernando Antonio Martinez group. In the meantime, Carrera decided that he would return to Guatemala and did so by entering via Weiwei Tenango where he met the native leaders and told them that they must remain united in order to prevail. The leaders agreed and slowly the segregated native communities started developing a new Indian identity under Carrera's leadership. In the meantime, in the eastern part of Guatemala, the Jalapa region became increasingly dangerous and former President Mariano Rivera Paz and the rebel leader Vicente Cruz were both murdered after they tried to take over the Corregidor office in 1849. When Carrera arrived in Chiantla and Huehuetenango, he received two alternative emissaries, that is, the alternative forces, who told him that their soldiers were not going to fight his forces because that would lead to a native revolt, much like that of 1840. Their only request from Carrera was to keep the natives under control, and uh, the alternative uh, forces did not comply, and led by Guzman and his forces, they started chasing Carrera, the Caudillo hid, helped by his native allies and remained under their protection when the forces of Miguel Garcia Granados, who arrived from Guatemala City, were looking for him. On learning that Officer Jose Victor Zavala had been appointed to Corregidor in Suchitip, Carrera and his hundred Hacateco bodyguards crossed a dangerous jungle infested with jaguars to meet his former friend. When they met Savala, not only did they not capture him, but they agreed to serve under his orders, thus sending a strong message to both the liberal and conservative parties in Guatemala City that they would have to negotiate with Crer or battle on two fronts, Quetzaltenango and Jalapa. Carrera went back to Quetzaltenango area while Savala remained in Suchitipiquez as a tactical maneuver. Carrera received a visit from a cabinet member of Paredes and told him that he had control of the native population and that he assured Paredes he would keep them appeased. When the emissary returned to Guatemala City, he told the president everything Carrera said and added that the native forces were formidable. Guzman went to Antigua, Guatemala to meet with another group of Paredes emissaries and they agreed that Los Altos would rejoin Guatemala and that the latter would help Guzman defeat his hated enemy and also build a port on the Pacific Ocean. Guzman was sure of victory this time, but his plan evaporated when, in his absence, Carrera and his native allies had occupied Quetzaltenango. Carrera appointed Ignacio Erogen as um, Corregidor boss and convinced him that he should work with the Quiche, Mam, Canjobal, and Mom leaders to keep the region under control. On his way out, Erosion murmured to a friend, now he is king of the Indians indeed. Guzman then left for Jalapa where he struck a deal with the rebels while Luis Maitres Juaros convinced President Paredes to deal with Carrera. Back in Guatemala City, within a few months, Carrera was commander-in-chief backed by the army and, politi and the political support of the Indian communities from the densely populated Western Highlands. During his first presidency, that is from 1844 to 1848, he brought the country back from excessive conservatism to a more moderate regime, and with the advice of Juan José de Aicena, Epeñol, and Pedro de Aicena, restored relations with the Vatican uh, in Rome and with the Concordat ratified in 1854. 
Well, then there's the second Carrera government that spans the period from 1851 to 1865. After Carrera returned from exile in 1849, Vasconcelos granted asylum to the Guatemalan liberals who harassed the Guatemalan government in several different forms. Jose Francisco Barundia did it through a liberal newspaper established with that specific goal. Vasconcelos gave support during a whole year to a rebel faction, La Montaña, in eastern Guatemala, providing and distributing money and weapons. By late 1850, Vasconcelos was getting impatient at the slow progress of the war with Guatemala and decided to plan an open attack. Under that circumstance, the Salvadorian head of state started a campaign against the conservative Guatemalan regime, inviting Honduras and Nicaragua to participate in the alliance. Only the Honduran government, led by Juan Lindo, accepted, and in 1851, Guatemala defeated an allied army from Honduras and El Salvador in the Battle of La Arada. In 1854, Carrera was declared supreme and perpetual leader of the nation for life, with the power to choose his successor. He was in that position until he died on April 14, 1865. While he pursued some measures to set up a foundation for economic prosperity to please the conservative landowners, the army challenged him at home and in a three-year war with Honduras, El Salvador, and Nicaragua, dominated his presidency. His rivalry with Gerardo Barrios, president of El Salvador, resulted in open war in 1863. And we're going to talk about El Salvador in the next lecture after these on Guatemala. At Coatepec, the Guatemalans suffered a severe defeat, which was followed by a truce. Honduras joined with El Salvador and Nicaragua and Costa Rica with Guatemala. The contest was finally settled in favor of Carrera, who besieged and occupied San Salvador and dominated Honduras and Nicaragua. Carrera continued to act in concert with the clerical party and tried to maintain friendly relations with the European governments. Before his death, Carrera nominated his friend and loyal soldier, Army Marshal Vicente Serna y Serna, as his successor. Now, Vicente Serna y Serna had government power from 1865 until 1871 as president of Guatemala. Uh, several liberal authors, like Alfonso Enrique Barrientos, describe Marshal Serna's government as this a conservative and archaic government, badly organized and with worse intentions, was in charge of the country, centralizing all powers in Vicente Serna, an ambitious military man who was not happy with the general rank had pro promoted himself to army marshal rank, even though that rank did not exist, and it does not exist even to this day in the Guatemalan military. <laughs> The marshal called himself President of the Republic, but in reality, he was the foreman of oppressed and savaged people, cowardly enough that they had not dared to tell the dictator to leave threatening him with a revolution and go away. It's necessary to make the following observations about that liberal comment. First of all, by conservative and archaic governments badly organized and with worse intentions, Barrientos meant that the state and church were a single unit and that the conservative regime was strongly allied to the power of the regular clergy of the Catholic Church, who was strongly allied to the power of the largest landowners in Guatemala. This tight relationship between church and state had been ratified by the Vatican Concordant of 1852, which was the law until Serna was deposed in 1871. And secondly, Oppressed and savage people, Barrientos refers here to the liberal Criollos, that is, the Creoles who had not dared to rise against Rafael Carrera's presidency of 1840-1865. Even the liberal generals like Serapio Cruz had realized the undeniable Carrera's political and military presence, who was practically invincible and even fought under his command. Actually, the liberals waited for a long time until Carrera's death to begin this revolt against the more tamed Serna. And thirdly, the army marshal rank did exist in the conservative Guatemalan army. 
after the invasion to El Salvador, officers Serapio Cruz, Tata Lapo, and Jose Victor Savala also were promoted to the martial rank along with Serna. They all were of great importance to the military life of Guatemala during Carrera's presidency. And during his presidency, the Liberal Party members were prosecuted and sent into ex exile, among them those who had started the Liberal Revolution of 1871 and brought about the Liberal governments of 1871 to 1898. Guatemala's Liberal Revolution in 1871, under the leadership of Justo Rufino Barrios, who worked to modernize the country, improve trade, and introduce new crops and manufacturing. During this era, coffee became, became an important crop for Guatemala. Barrios had ambitions of reuniting Central America, and he took the country to war in an unsuccessful attempt to attain the rest of Central America, losing his life on the battlefield in 1885 against forces in El Salvador. Manuel Barrios was a Guatemalan general and president from 1886 to 1892. Manuel Barrios was unique among liberal presidents of Guatemala between 1871 and 1894 in that he handed over power to his successor peacefully. When election time approached, he sent for the three liberal candidates to ask them what their government plan would be. Happy with what he heard from General Reina Barrios, Barrios made sure that a huge column of Quetzaltenango and Totonicapan indigenous people came down from the mountains to vote for General Reina Barrios. Reynos was elected president. Then, Jose Maria Reina Barrios was president from 1892 to 1898, and during Barrios' first term in office, the power of the landover, landowners over the rural peasantry increased. He oversaw the rebuilding of parts of Guatemala City on a grander scale with wide Parisian-style avenues built. He oversaw Guatemala hosting the first Expo Central Amer American Fair, uh, just translated there, in 1897. During his second term, Barrios printed bonds to fund his ambitious plans, fueling monetary infl inflation and the rise of popular opposition to his regime. His administration also worked on improving roads, installing national and international telegraphs, and introducing electricity to Guatemala City. Completing a transoceanic railway was the main objective of his government, with a goal to attract international investors at a time when the Panama Canal was not yet built. And the Manuel Estrados Cabrera regime lasted from 1898 to 1920. After the assassination of General Jose Maria Reno Barrios in 1898, the Guatemalan cabinet called an emergency meeting to appoint a new successor, but declined to invite Estrada Cabrera to the uh, meeting. Now, even though he was the first designated to the presidency, there are two versions how, of how he was able to get the presidency. One is that Estrada Cabrera entered with pistol drawn to assert his entitlement to the presidency, and the other that Estrada Cabrera showed up unarmed to the meeting and demanded to be given the presidency as he was the first designated. The first Guatemalan head of state taken from civilian life in over 50 years, Estrada Cabrera overcame resistance to his regime by August of 1898 and called for September elections, which he won handily. In 1898, the legislature convened for the election of President Estrada Cabrera who triumphed thanks to the large number of soldiers and policemen who went to vote in civilian clothes and to the large number of illiterate families that they brought with them to the polls. One of Estrada Carrera's most famous and most bitter legacies was allowing the entry of the United Fruit Company into the Guatemalan economic and political arena, which is the same as saying introducing U.S. imperialism into Guatemala. As a member of the Liberal Party, he sought to encourage the development of the nation's infrastructure of the highways, railroads, and seaports for the sake of expanding the export economy. By the time Estrada Cabrera assumed the presidency, there had been repeated efforts to construct a railroad from the major port of Puerto Barrios to the capital of Guatemala City.
due to lack of funding, exacerbated by the collapse of the internal coffee trade, the railway fell 60 miles short of its goal. That is around 100 kilometers. Estrada Cabrera decided without consulting the legislature or the judiciary that striking a deal with the United Fruit Company was the only way to get that railroad finished and Cabrera signed a contract with the United Fruit Company's miner Cooper Keith in 1904 that gave the company tax exemptions, land grants, and control of all railroads on the Atlantic side. So again, U.S. imperialism is uh, exerting itself now seriously through the United Fruit Company financing of the Guatemalan government and in particular its railroad. Estrada Cabrera often employed brutal methods to assert his authority. Right at the beginning of his first presidential period, he started prosecuting his political rivals and soon established a well-organized web of spies. One U.S. ambassador returned to the United States after he learned the dictator had given orders to poison him. Former President Manuel Barrios was stabbed to death in Mexico City. Estrada Cabrera responded violently to worker strikes against the United Fruit Company. In one instant, when United Fruit went directly to Estrada Cabrera to resolve a strike, after the armed forces had refused to respond, the president ordered an armed unit to enter a worker's compound. The forces arrived at night, firing indiscriminately into the workers' sleeping quarters, wounding and kill killing an unspecified number of United Fruit Company workers. In 1906, 1906, Estrada faced serious revolts against his rule. The rebels were supported by the governments of some of the other Central American nations, but Estrada succeeded in putting them down. Elections were held by the people against the will of Estrada Cabrera, and thus he had the president-elect murdered in retaliation. In 1907, Estrada narrowly survived an assassination attempt himself when a bomb exploded under his carriage. It has been suggested that the extreme despotic characteristics of Estrada did not emerge until after this attempt on his life in 1907, but I think you can see that he was that way all the time. Guatemala City was badly damaged in the 1917 Guatemala earthquake. Estrada Cabrera continued in power until forced to resign after new revolts in 1920. By this time, his power had declined dramatically, and he was reliant upon the loyalty of a few generals. While the United States threatened intervention if he was removed through revolution, a bipartisan coalition came together to remove him from the presidency. He was removed from office after the National Assembly charged that he was mentally incompetent and appointed Carlos Herrera in his place on April 8, 1920. Now we'll take a look at the Jorge Ubico regime, which goes from 1931 to 1944. Jorge Ubico was the, author to, was the ruler of Guatemala, the dictator, from February 1931 to July 1944, a general in the Guatemalan army. He was elected to the presidency in 1931 in an election where he was the only candidate. He continued his predecessor's policy of giving massive concessions to the United Fruit Company and wealthy landowners, as well as supporting their brutal labor practices. He was toppled by a pro-democracy uprising in 1944, which led to the 10-year Guatemalan Revolution. Adopting a pro-USA stance to promote economic development and recovery from depression, the United Fruit Company under Ubico became the most important company in Guatemala. He considered Guatemala to be the closest ally of the United States in the Caribbean. The company received import duty and real estate tax exemptions from the government and controlled more land than any other individual or group. It also controlled the only railroad in the country, the only facilities capable of producing electricity, and the port facilities at Puerto Barrios on the Atlantic coast. Ubico considered himself to be another Napoleon. He admired Napoleon Bonaparte extravagantly and preferred to have his photograph taken in his general's uniform, although he was much taller and fatter than his hero. Ubico believed that he resembled Bonaparte, and his nickname was that he gave himself 
the little Napoleon of the tropics. He dressed ostentatiously and surrounded himself with statues and pa paintings of Napoleon Bonaparte, regularly commenting on the similarities between their appearance. He militarized numerous political and social institutions, including the post office, all the schools, the symphony orchestras, and he placed army officers in charge of many government posts. He frequently traveled around the country performing inspections in dress uniform, followed by a military escort, a mobile radio station, an official biographer, and cabinet members, much as you see of that movie Moon Over Peridor, with uh, where their dictator traveled around. At any rate, from 1944 to 1996, we enter an entirely new period, which uh, the Mexican painter Diego Rivera uh, uh, painted a painting called The Glorious Victory, uh, Gloriosa Victoria, and in it he represents the Guatemalan coup from 1954. That's the one where the CIA overthrew the uh, elected government of uh, Arbenz. At the center of the painting is Secretary of State John Foster Dulles shaking hands with Carlos Castillo Armas. CIA Director Alan Dulles and the American Ambassador to Guatemala John Purifoy are giving away money among Guatemalan Army officers while natives work as slaves filling up United Fruit Company ships with bananas. At the Ambassador's feet lies an anthropomorphized bomb with a smiling Eisenhower's face. In the background is Archbishop Rosselli y Arellano giving mass over the dead bodies of massacred workers. So that was uh, Diego Rivera's contribution to uh, showing what this kind of a U.S. puppet government was. On July 1st, 1944, the dictator Jorge Ubico was forced to resign his office in response to a wave of protests and a general strike inspired by brutal labor conditions among plantation workers. His replacement by General Juan Federico Ponce Valdez uh, was forced out of office on October 20, 1944 by a coup d'etat led by Major Francisco Javier Araña and Captain Jacobo Arbenz Guzman. This is the guy that's going to become president. About 100 people were killed in this coup. The country was led by a military junta made up of Arana, Arbenz, and Jorge Torriello Guerrilla. The, the junta organized Guatemala's first free election, which was won with the majority of 86% by the prominent writer and teacher Juan Jose Arevalo Bernejo. He had been living in exile in Argentina for 14 years. Arevalo was first democratically elected president of Guatemala to complete the term for which he was elected. His Christian socialist policies were inspired to a large degree by the U.S. New Deal of President Franklin D. Roosevelt during the Great Depression. Amongst his major policies was a new labor code designed to right the balance between workers and landowners and industrialists that was criticized by the landowners and the upper class as communist. Arevalo was succeeded by Jacobo Arbenz Guzman, who was elected in 1951. Arbenz adopted a major land reform policy implemented under Decree 900 passed in 1952. It ordered redistribution of uncultivated fallow lands of large estates to the peasants that worked it, including indigenous mines. It was intended to increase production of crops and provide many peasants with income. His popular program of land reform, credit, and literacy began to diminish the extreme inequality in Guatemala, although the process of redistributing land created conflict with the landowners. In 1954, Arbenz was overthrown in a coup d'etat orchestrated by the U.S. CIA on the pretext that a socialist government would become a Soviet puppet in the Western Hemisphere. We know that the CIA overthrew Arbenz to protect the property of the United Fruit Company, which is now Chiquita Brands International, a major U.S. company that faced losing large amounts of land due to the agrarian reform and was dissatisfied with the compensation it received. Carlos Castillo Arbas, a former military officer who led the CIA-backed invasion from Honduras, was installed as president in 1954, uh, replacing Arbenz. 
Castillo reversed Decree 900 and ruled until July 26, 1957, when he was assassinated by Romeo Vasquez, a member of his personal guard. After the rigged election that followed, General Miguel Idigres Fuentes assumed power. Now this is the guy that we're going to take, uh, is going to take up Fidel Castro's time, and in fact, the Idigros regime was now the most brutal U.S. United Fruit Company regime yet to be imposed on, Nicar on Guatemala, as if what had gone before wasn't sufficiently brutal. And uh, this thing goes on to this very day. Um, the, uh, his successor is going to be a man named, man named Rios Montt, who was even worse than he was. But we're going to pick this up in Lecture 30B, and we'll talk about how Fidel Castro intervenes now. As soon as 1962 is passed and the Cuban Revolution is successful, it's possible for the Cubans to start getting involved directly in defending Guatemala uh, and in helping all of the different peoples of Latin America fight for their independence and their freedom. So we'll pick up the story then.